and they were afraid and they were afraid now watch this as long as man was acting a fool long as he was cutting himself long as he was screaming making all kind of noise long as he was acting crazy long as he was calling women bees and hoes long as he was doing that which was self destructive the people were okay but the moment he seated at the feet of Jesus dressed right he ain't skin no more In his right mind, the text says they got scared. There is nothing, brothers, this nation fears more than a black man who is clothed in his right mind. And hooked up with Jesus. You can imagine this brother say, Well, what had happened was for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on, eat flat, son. <laughs> And whosoever believes in him uh, shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. Uh, I can hear this brother saying, what had happened was, uh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, uh, and behold, all things uh, become new uh, I can hear him saying what had helped uh, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God uh, is eternal life uh, what had happened was uh, cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you um, what had happened was uh, can't nobody Do me like Jesus. Uh, lean on somebody. Uh, can't nobody do me like the Lord. Uh, bless his name. Uh, I need you to know uh, that God is able to um, deliver you. Uh, God is able uh, to lift you up. Um, uh, God is able uh, to bring you out. Uh, God is able uh, to make a way uh, out of no way. And so in our text, uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, the Lord calls down from glory. Uh, because Adam and Eve were hiding because uh, they had disobeyed the Lord uh, and the Lord says Adam where are you uh, bless his name he said I was hiding uh, why were you hiding because uh, I was naked uh, who told you you're naked bless his name and there's been too many brothers that have been hiding hiding on the cross
honorable. Your work's not done just because you made it to the palace. Bless the name of the Lord. But you've got a responsibility to help somebody else make it across. Thank you, Jesus. Don't pull up the ladder because you climbed to the top. Don't blow up the bridge because you made your way across. Thank you, Jesus. But reach your hand back down the ladder and pull somebody else up out of Lodabar. Ninety point seven WTCC. Good morning. Welcome to the Spoken Word. I'm your host, Bishop Talbert Swam the second. And as usual, we'll tell it like it is through cultural idioms and nuances that shape the order, ethos, and chaos of the African American experience. Words have their own vitality. They shape their own consciousness and create their own context for interpreting social and spiritual reality. The spoken word contains the power to reshape the landscape of society. Let me do a time check. It is four minutes past the hour of 9 a.m. I wanna thank all of you who are tuned in here in the Pioneer Valley and on the World Wide Web across the nation and the globe. I want to thank Mr. Jim Malakias for bringing us to you remotely again. I'm live in the man cave during this pandemic season, and he's, bring, he's been bringing us uh, live over the air uh, for the past 10, 11 months consistently um, so we can connect one to another, 413-337-1867. Listen, I got a good topic I need to talk about today. First, I want to welcome all of our listening audience. Um, I see some of my preacher friends on here. The great Bishop Don W. Shelby Jr., all the way from Detroit, Michigan, is tuned in. Good morning, sir, and welcome to The Spoken Word. So honored to have you peeking in on us on this morning. Um, the pastor, Jesse Burgess, is with us on this morning. Um, my good friend, Deacon George Lovejoy, good morning to you. Good morning to everybody. I start calling names and I get in trouble, uh, but there's some special people. All of you are special, uh, but every now and then I need to acknowledge some folks um, that are definitely um, special people who are tuned in to us on this morning. Do me a favor, rep your city, rep your town. Let me know where you're chiming in from. We always like to see where our listening audience is listening in from. Um, so let people know you ain't ashamed. West side, south side, east side, north side of whatever city or town you're coming from. And we'll certainly acknowledge some of those cities and towns. Uh, welcome to the Facebook audience, the YouTube audience. Uh, my Instagram is popping. Um, my Twitter is popping. Um, Welcome to all of you. I see Alexandria, Virginia jumped on it real quick. Uh, let you know that they are in the house over there on YouTube. Welcome, Virginia, uh, up in here, up in here. Um, listen, today, I, I listen, Bill Maher and um, Megan Santa Claus's wife, Kelly, uh, were on real time with Bill Maher um, last week talking about how bad white folks have it, you know, how oppressed white folks are in America and how it's a shame these white kids have to learn about racism at such a young age. Now, they don't care that black kids have to experience racism. Then they started talking about the victimhood mentality. 
we're going to deal with this whole this whole notion, this whole misnomer about victimhood. It's amazing how white folks can victimize black people in America for 400 years and then tell black folk when they respond to their victimization that they are displaying victimhood, that they have a victim mentality. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna unpack this white supremacist term about victimhood. Uh, how can you be the that's like raping someone and telling them stop playing the victim? That that's that's in a nutshell, that's basically what they're doing. We're gonna deal with that. We're gonna deal with that and uh, also coming up at um half past the hour, uh, Senator Eric Lesser will be coming on and giving us the state house update. Um, so stay tuned for that. Find out what's happening here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and then for those that are live streaming, uh, we go off of WTCC at 10. Uh, but those who want to kick it with me for another half an hour on the live stream, the first lady will be coming up um, at 10 o'clock. So got a lot going on today. Stay with us. Don't you touch the dial. We'll be right back. <laughs> Abundant love for me, he came to bring. Oh, yes, when I look in the mirror, I love what I see. She's looking good. That strong, beautiful black woman, that woman is me. Sister and double check and called me back. Said he hanged himself in his room and had been there for days. Initially, it didn't hit me, then it clicked. And I remember that I hadn't seen or heard from the homie all week. Wish he had told me what had him feeling lonely and weak. I guess everybody got demons we don't even speak of. Cause I was with him exactly a week before the call. Just of the 20, he couldn't even purchase alcohol. My best friend for like six or seven years. I'm not ashamed to say I shed a plenty of tears, but it was hard. He was somebody I had plenty of memories with. The first person I ever burned any trees with. The worst feeling is knowing that you will leave us in all this grievance without a reason. One of the first people to ever believe in me when it came down to it. You knew you could call me if you needed me. Cause that information I wouldn't have ever imagined. It's sad thinking about it. I ain't happy that it happened, but it made me. There was plenty times when I thought that it would drive me crazy. But looking back on it, now I see all the time that it gave me. 
I learn more about why I am who I am on the daily. I know it may sound crazy, but I'm glad that it made me. Yeah, was born the son of a pastor. He was who I was named after. Matter of fact, I even got some of his characteristics. Both of us got messages for the people. I just do mine with rhythm on beat. He do his on the pulpit with scriptures. Well connected, respected in the community. Ever since I was little, I felt like there was some pressure on me. It started off with little stuff like when my folk brought us to church and then they forced us to get up and say a testimony. Getting older, had to watch how I acted in public. Cause people wouldn't hesitate to put that in discussion. Chatting like, is it that the past is kid? I'm like, yeah, it asked me, but please don't expect me to be exactly like my daddy. Don't discredit my family for how I am. I'm not a little kid no more, I'm now a man. And I ain't pointing fingers, I'm not trying to do no blaming at all. When it comes to how I came up, I wouldn't change it at all because it made me. There was plenty times when I thought that it would drive me crazy. But looking back on it, now I see all the job that it gave me. I learned more about why I am who I am on the daily. I know it may sound crazy, but I'm glad that it made me. Yeah, glad that it made me. Yeah, glad that it made me. Looking back on it, now I see all the job that it gave me. So glad that it made me. Ninety point seven WTCC. Good morning. Welcome to the spoken word. I got North Houston in the house. Good morning to my frat brother, Brother Keith Jordan in the house. I see Sister Vivian Blackshear all the way from Delaware, up in here, up in here. I see you, Mark Dorsey. I see you, Zyda Govan, who is running for city council in, the, in Ward 8. Uh, I see y'all. I see you, Monique Boyd Warren. Good morning, everybody who's chiming in from everywhere. Good to have you on the spoken word. Do me a favor, share, share. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, um, like, and share it on your Facebook platforms. Uh, let me let's get some more sharers in here, Facebook. Go on and share it in your groups. Share it on your pages. Um, uh, Y'all on Periscope. I think this is like the last week for Periscope. Periscope is is history as of March 3rd. And I'm unsure as to how we connect through Twitter. So I have to figure that out between now and next week. Um, but those on Periscope slash Twitter, um, do me a favor and share, 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 share. Let somebody know. That we is on the air. 413-337-1867. I, I, I know that you have noticed all of these conversations um, in which folk keep talking about any level of conversation about racism, about white supremacy, racism, anti-black bigotry in America, they, they're always uh, labeling them as rhetoric, as if, as if it's, 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 it's just people being hyperbolic, um, that, is, that it has no basis in truth. Um, in, in, in racist white America, they want to pretend that the conversations about systemic racism are nothing but rhetoric as if black folk are just making this stuff up. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, that, that, that it's figments of our imagination um, and it's not steeped in a reality of the historic oppression, colonization, brutalization, and dehumanization of black people 
by white folks in America. Um, they they want to try to erase history uh, as it exists, rewrite it, and then say black folks complaining about both historic and contemporary oppression have a victim mentality. It's some um, psychological malady that we have that that we're born with that 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 is inherent in our blackness that we you know we just we play the victim and um there's no reality about what we're talking about uh, you know they claim uh, that there's always two sides to the story but they always feel that their side is the only legitimate side. They push back against any idea that makes them uncomfortable. See, 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 they don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to be taken. That's what white fragility is all about. It's all about white folks being taken out of their comfort zone and being forced to deal with their flaws forced to deal with the fact that they are not superior, forced to deal with the fact that they have been brutal in their treatment of black people in particular and non-white folks in general. Um, and so they don't want to talk about that. So, so basically they have to put a label on those who do talk about that, a pejorative label to make them feel as if, you know, there's something wrong with their mentality. There's nothing wrong with the mentality of a racist, but there's something wrong with the mentality of victims of racism who challenge the bigotry that is lodged against them. So they don't want to feel uncomfortable. Um, so they try their hardest to make others drop any attempts to talk about these things publicly. So they accuse them of being racial justice warriors, of being so-called reverse racists. And it really just shows how nervous they are about the truth finally coming out. I mean, they're frightened that this house of cards of white supremacy that they have built to promote the supremacy of white people will fall down. Um, I've talked about the disrespectful nature of the term all lives matter uh, because it was, it was crafted in response to black lives matter, not because they really think that all lives matter. Cause if they thought all lives matter, we wouldn't have to say black lives matter. Um, but as a rebuttal to Black Lives Matter, I've seen the vitriolic responses by folk on social media when we talk about Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm used to it. I know the white supremacist playbook. Many of you know it as well. I mean, it's old as American racism. The basic nature of this backlash is basically to distract us by constantly trying to change the subject, constantly trying to change the narrative. Those who don't want to talk about racism go out of their way to not debate the merits of the arguments for systemic racism by attempting to change the subject and to get you off topic so you never come back to the topic at hand. They use whataboutism. They start throwing around these false statistics about black people being X percentage of the population, but committing most of the murders. Um, uh, when you talk about the extrajudicial murder of black people by police, they say, what about black on black crime? I mean, it, it, it's, it's nonstop the ridiculousness that they go through to try to change the subject. Good morning, caller. Yes, Bishop Swan, how are you doing today, brother? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, this uh, question,
question it might be like a little bit off of the topic maybe sort of you know related to right because i just wanted your personal opinion on this not a conservative opinion but your opinion because you're real and you keep it real 100. um when we talk about like you know crime in like inner cities like you know regardless of where they are when, when it comes to the black community in your personal opinion what do you think might be like the main cause of that well, first of all, I don't think there's any. Here's the thing. If you police a particular neighborhood and you profile a certain people more than you do others, you're always going to come up with more crime. Case, case in point, uh, studies have shown that white folks actually engage in illegal drugs more than black people do. Yet black people are arrested and incarcerated at much higher rates for the use of illegal substances, not because they use it more than white folks, but because their neighborhoods are profiled by police. The cops aren't in white neighborhoods um, arresting uh, white folks for the same things that they're arresting black folks for. So I think when you look at the numbers when it comes to crime, um, they often get skewed because of the way policing is done in America. And policing in America is nothing but the grandchild of slave patrols. The first police in America uh, came about to protect the property of white landowners um, mm -hmm. and to track down slaves. Um, so it was all about protecting white folks and keeping black folk in check. Not much has changed about policing in America today. It's still about protecting uh, white property owners and keeping black folk in check. When you look at what happened in Kenosha, the reason these white folk jumped on the bandwagon defending Kyle Rittenhouse, who murdered two protesters, because they said he was there protecting property. Once again, protect white property and keep black people in check. Mm. Yeah, and it's true because I looked at some report uh, uh, release, you know, from the FBI. According to, I mean, their statistics, the rates of violent crime within poor white communities and poor black communities are actually very similar mm -hmm. no different at all and the same thing when, when when you talk about murder people always talk about 90 percent of black people are murdered by other black people well 89 percent of white folks are murdered by other white folk but do you ever hear anybody say what about white on white crime no because they always want to focus on black people right and then also where is the crime happening? Because obviously the crime isn't happening in rich black communities or middle class black communities. It's usually happening in poor black areas. Yeah, and 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 poverty breeds violence. Um, that, that I mean, that's a fact. There is a definite correlation between uh, crime and poverty. And like you said, that exists where poor black people live and where poor white people live. So, I mean, I don't know. I think it's more of like, an environmental issue. So if you want to invest in the culture, invest in the environment to improve the culture, regardless of what race you're talking about here. Absolutely. Appreciate your That's call. All I had to say. Thank you, sir. 413-337-1867. Love to have you. Uh, if you want to chime in on the conversation, um, um, listen, don't fall for the okie doke. Don't fall for the look over there um, so that they can take your attention off of what we need to deal with. You know, they ignore the research that shows um, the nature of systemic racism and its negative effect um, and the harm it causes. It causes harm physically, mentally, and socially. They want black people to think it's all in our minds and that we're just making it up. Um, 
that that it's not about what white folks are actually doing it's about our victim mentality let me let me let me let me play this um let me play this clip this short short clip um of megan kelly on bill maher real time with bill maher now you you remember megan kelly she got fired um from um her show uh because uh, she basically said there was nothing wrong with wearing blackface uh but even before she got fired from her show it was the same megan kelly uh who was talking about um both santa claus and jesus were white that they just are and basically, you know, black folk just need to get over the fact that Santa and Jesus are white. Um, neither one of them uh, are white. Jesus was a black man. And Santa Claus is based on the life of St. Nicholas, uh, who was a black man who lived in Turkey. Uh, so Santa ain't white and neither is Jesus. Uh, but this is the Megyn Kelly who got on uh, with Bill Maher talking about um, that we shouldn't lean in to the victimhood. Leaning in to victimhood. Oh, boy. Listen to this foolishness. That's the push is, is to lean into victimhood. And it's not just a race thing. I mean, I see it with right. some of my fellow women. You know, it's not that the Me Too situation wasn't real, but we don't have to lean into victimhood even when we might be victims well listen even if you are a real victim which i have been in the past too it isn't psychologically helpful to lean into no 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 notice that she says that she's been a victim too you know rich white lady multi-millionaire white lady she's a victim she took her kids out of a posh expensive private school because she said they were leaning too far to the left and they began to talk about social justice she couldn't take it anymore couldn't take it anymore how dare they teach my white kids about social justice i mean how dare they tell my white kids that Justice belongs to everybody, not just white people. How dare they tell them that? And then her and Bill Maher go off on a tangent talking about how kids shouldn't have to be taught about racism at such a young age. Well, tell that to Ayanna Jones. Oh, can't talk to Ayanna Jones. She was murdered by police at seven years old. Well, tell that to... Tamir Rice, oh, sorry, can't tell that to Tamir Rice, because he was murdered by white police at 12 years old. So let, let's see, tell that to Laquan McDonald. Oh, no, you can't tell it to Laquan McDonald, because he was shot 16 times in the back as he walked away by white police. And the white mayor of Chicago hid the video to try to cover up the crime. Let's see. Um, oh, tell that to Trayvon Mark. Oh, no. Can't tell it to Trayvon. He was murdered at 17. And the jury acquitted his murderer. Said he was just standing his ground. My goodness. Can't tell it to a whole lot of black kids. Listen, if black children have to experience racism on a day-to-day -day basis in America, hell, white kids can learn about it in the classroom. And it's best that they learn about it in the classroom because it'll help them deal with the fact that they're being taught it in the home let's just keep talk. the reason why racism continues in this nation is it gets passed down from white generation to white generation 
Yeah. They're not born with it. It's taught to them. You know, but people like Megyn Kelly doesn't think it should be addressed in an academic setting, that, they're, that, that we're supposed to ignore the reality of systemic racism in America in the classroom, that, 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 that her precious children shouldn't have to be taught. And, and, and basically what it is, is it's, it's y'all, it's not, it's not the racism that exists in America, it's y'all victim mentality. It's not that black folk are 21 times more likely to be racially profiled. It's that you're leaning in to victimhood. It's not that you all are being murdered by police at a higher rate than everybody else. It's that you're leaning in to victimhood. It's not that black folk and white folk use drugs at a comparative rate with white folks using drugs actually a little more than black folk. And black folk actually get arrested and sentenced more than white folks. It's that we're leaning in to victimhood. It's not that Breonna Taylor gets murdered by three white cops and the system fails to indict them that they indict one cop for shooting into the wall of the white neighbor, not into the body of a black woman. That, that's not what it is. It's that y'all are just leaning in to victimhood, according to Megan Santa Claus's White Kelly. See, that's a term that white supremacists use to keep you silent. They tell you, stop being a victim. Stop having a victimhood mentality. As I said at the, at the beginning of the show, that's like the rapist telling the woman he just tied up and raped. Stop acting like a victim. Stop having a victim mentality. That, that, Basically, in essence, that's what white America has done to us. They've raped us and then told us to stop acting like victims. It's the caucasity of whiteness. It's the audacity of white privilege, patriarchy, and a supremacist mentality. To tell people that you have colonized brutalized, dehumanized, and oppressed, that they need to stop acting like victims, but you don't need to stop your violence against black bodies. The caucasity of you, you know, but we recognize your tools. We recognize your tools. We recognize that you are trying to cover up what you're doing with this dog whistle language that you keep using. Okay. It's, it's, it's basically coded racial appeals that carefully manipulate hostility towards black people. And sometimes it's not even a dog whistle, it's a whole bullhorn. I mean, there are language patterns that, that are classic examples of processes playing out to suppress black voices. Um, you know, uh, we're all aware of the protests against police brutality. Um, and every time there's a protest against police brutality, what's the dog whistle? What about black on black crime? That's a trope that's used to distract us. Then they use the, well, what about black babies being aborted? Even though 
60% of abortions are white babies being aborted from white women who got pregnant by white men. But what about black abortions? These are tropes. These are dog whistles that are used to distract us. How many times have you heard them say uh, that those who were taking a knee were disrespecting those who served in the military? Um, or sports is not the place for politics. And then this is one of their favorites. Well, if you don't like America, you can leave. And what's amazing about that is most of the folk who say that kind of foolery are white folks whose families just got here two generations ago. Grandma, granddad came over from the old country. You know, um, and they're telling black folk who have been here for seven, eight generations, well, y'all can leave. Hell, we built this nation. This nation was built on the blood, sweat, tears, and labor of my ancestors. Your ancestors came here in search of a better life after America rose through the ranks and became one of the richest nations in the world because my ancestors made cotton king in the South. So how dare you tell me to leave America when your people came here for a better life because my people made America a place for you to come and seek out to fulfill your dreams. That's what they say though when we complain about systemic racism. Well, you know, if you don't if you don't like being raped and murdered and lynched and brutalized and profiled and dehumanized, then just leave. It's never how about we just stop our violence toward black bodies? How about we just stop promoting white supremacy? How about we just stop the extrajudicial murder of black people? How, how about we just dismantle the systemic inequities in the criminal injustice system? That's too difficult. The easy answer is for y'all to say, why don't y'all just leave? You don't like being oppressed? Leave. I, I, this is how white America consistently blames the black community for their problems. You know, um, they say black folk are their own worst enemy. In this fashion, we get distracted. We start arguing with them about the things that are obvious. And what they're doing is they're simply gaslighting. They're simply gaslighting. The black on black crime narrative um, that comes into the conversation, gaslighting. The, the black victims being responsible uh, for their own uh, plight, gaslighting. Blaming black folk who are killed by police is gaslighting. You know, saying, oh, well, they weren't complying. Yet white folks uh, uh, hit police, pull knives on police, pull guns on police, and they still walk away but they shoot and murder unarmed black people while well, they weren't complying. So they deserve to get killed. I don't care if they didn't have a weapon. So Sandra Bland deserved to die because she wouldn't put out a cigarette. Tamir Rice deserved to die at 12 years old because he was sitting on a swing with a toy gun in a park. I mean, I'm sure no white kids have ever played with toy guns in the park. Show me a story, I challenge you, of a white kid playing with a toy gun, getting murdered by police. 
I've been looking for somebody to show me a story like that since Tamir Rice was murdered. Haven't found it yet. But a black kid playing with a toy deserved to get murdered. There's something sick about a mentality when you blame a 12-year-old for their own murder because they had the audacity to be playing with a toy like children do. Something sick about that mentality. To blame the victim and tell the victim that the problem is their victim mentality. 413-337-1867. All right, I was trying to get the senator I thought he would have been in by now, but looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Let me see if I can get him in again. Um, that might be my fault, Senator. Let me see if I can get you in. I think he had the wrong link to get in. Let me see if if we can get Senator Lesser up in here. In the meantime, 433-371867 is the number here. Um, victimhood. There's no such thing as victimhood when it comes to black folk fighting against white supremacy. That's the bottom line. That's a dog whistle. That's a racist trope. That's that's the go-to um, uh, rhetoric when it comes to trying to refute um, the narrative about white supremacy, racism, and anti-black bigotry. Let me get Senator Lesser on. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Senator. Looks like you probably had the wrong yeah. link, but we got you on now. <laughs> Sorry about that. How are you? Good morning. No problem. It's, Good morning. Case of the Mondays. <laughs> yes, sir. How you feeling? Good. Good. Yeah. No. Powerful. Uh, powerful comments just before I, I came on. I was listening, but I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't get it. Get in backstage. But uh, yeah. Good yes, morning. Sir. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. No problem at all. So I see. Uh, as there's been a whole lot of conversation about our little chat the other day. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, a good amount of, um, attraction in terms of, um, uh, the subject matter. So, so that's good. I think that was a little catchy, your little, um, uh, one minute or lesser. Oh yeah. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta do a 60 seconds or, uh, 60 seconds or swan version, but, uh, yeah, I can't, I, my, Thank name, you. my name just doesn't fit with it though. You know, yeah, <laughs> I, I can't say one minute or swanner, yeah. you know. <laughs> Uh, but no, thanks. Uh, it was fun to turn the mic around a little bit. But uh, yeah, we covered we covered a lot of topics in a uh, twenty eight minutes or or however long it was, to, you know, twenty nine minutes. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that, Bishop. Absolutely, absolutely. So first, before you give us a, a quick update on what's happening in the, in the state house, what's up with the Democrats that are? Um, standing in the way of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I, I, I mean, yeah. you, and I know it's only a few of them or a couple of them or whatever the case may be. Uh, but I mean, it's amazing to me how they talk about how we are so indebted to our essential workers, et cetera, et cetera. But then you turn around and say, but we don't want to pay these essential workers at least $15 an hour. Yeah, I mean, I'm scratching my head. I mean, I, I think it is worth, you know, our, our two senators, Ed Markey and Elizabeth Warren, certainly are, are supportive of it. But uh, it's very frustrating. I mean, one of the good examples, you know, here in Massachusetts, at a state level, we raised the minimum wage to $15. And it's a step by step increase. Florida has raised it, you know, which is a state that voted for Trump, they raised it by referendum. Uh, so it's obviously very popular. And you're exactly right, Bishop. I mean, 
if the if the recession caused by COVID nineteen, if all of the social distancing measures, the job losses have hurt anyone the most, it's been our frontline service workers who are predominantly workers of color, also disproportionately women. Um, these are home health workers, grocery store workers, mm -hmm. restaurant workers. They've been devastated by COVID nineteen, and they make minimum wage uh, in many cases. So. You know, to me, it, it was a very important way to uh, to not only show thank you to them, say thank you to them, but also to help lift millions of people out of poverty. I think there was a, a CBO analysis that said that it would lift a million people out of poverty mm -hmm. almost overnight. Uh, very disappointing. Um, you know, what we can control here in Massachusetts, you know, we have it. So it's, it's, it's less relevant for us uh, here in Massachusetts, but for a lot of other states, the minimum wage is far below that uh, and is far below what a family can sustain themselves on. Uh, so yeah, no, I share the, I share the frustration with that. Um, well, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but uh, it's, it, it, no. It, it, you know, it, it begs the question of, you know, how real are the pronouncements that get made on election on ele at election time when it comes yeah. time to govern? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, the um, secretary of the Department of um, Secondary Education has announced that uh, he is going to request um, authorization um, to go back to um, five days a week uh, in the classroom um, with with our um, uh, elementary school children and then progressively include middle school and high school uh, with with no hybrid right. um, uh, and no remote learning um, and and my understanding is that is that the governor supports this uh, in this season where we're talking about variants of covid 19. We're talking about um, a real rocky rollout of of the vaccination. To put it mildly, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To put it mildly, um, um, why in the world would we even be entertaining a conversation about going back into the classroom five days a week? Well, I, you know, I, I'm very frustrated, frankly, with how the Baker administration. Look, you and I have talked about the the governor many, many, many times on this show. Uh, you know, he's done some things right. He's made some hard decisions, uh, and that's bipartisan. You know, I'm a Democrat, he's a Republican, and we we support that in a crisis. But they are really not handling this this vaccine rollout well, and. You know, on the school reopening, look, you're a parent, I'm a parent. I think all of us want kids back in school, of course. But why are teachers not being prioritized for vaccines? You know, th this is a real question. You know, our other peer states, uh, states around the country have prioritized teachers. They seem to want everything all at once. They want the benefit of kids back in school without making the hard decisions, both in terms of money and resources, to make sure it's done safely. So, you know, my response back to the Baker administration is you want schools reopened. Well, get vaccines to our frontline workers and to our teachers uh, who have been prioritized right. in other states and they're not prioritizing yeah. them here. That's what's amazing to me is 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 you didn't prioritize teachers, but you want to put them back in an environment that puts them at risk puts our children at risk who are, who are at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of any vaccination um, consideration. Uh, and then when children come home uh, with COVID, uh, you know, uh, even those who are asymptomatic, uh, they, they're potentially passing it off to their older parents yeah. and grandparents. I mean, at yeah. this point, the state is giving out about 150,000 vaccines a week. Uh, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head how many teachers there are in the entire state. But if you prioritize, you know, K through two, which I think everybody knows is probably the most important, the youngest kids getting them back first, you know, even if you did 10, 15,000 a week, you know, that's a small number of the total amount that's getting vaccinated now statewide. You can do it uh, if you put a plan together and if you make it a party. I got to say, Bishop, I mean, just for me to vent for a second, uh, I don't know if people yeah. saw, but last week we had Governor Baker testify at a uh, COVID-19 oversight hearing chaired actually by our neighbor in Northampton, Joe Comerford. And we really went after him. You know, the website crashed. At first, they were dismissive of, of even needing a, a phone option for people who might not be fluent with computers. At first, it was only in English. 
The Eastfield Mall site, as you and I have talked about, it's a lot better yeah. now, but when it opened, it was a disaster. They had no mm -hmm. planning. They took the vaccine doses away from our community health centers, our local clinics, our public health departments that know our communities the best, centralized them into these into these mass vac sites, and then didn't even give the local communities access to those mass vac sites. So, you know, there have been serious problems with how this vaccine rollout has gone, and they're now pushing it. You know, they he announced last week the opening of Fenway Park and other big venues. The CDC director, who, by the way, is from Massachusetts, said the very same day that states need to slow down as we get vaccines out and as we wait for these variants. So I'm really concerned that a year of work uh, and a year of real sacrifice by people is being put at risk at this very pivotal moment because of hasty mm. planning. And the school announcement, to your point, Bishop, is, an, is another example of that. Yeah. And then when I looked at uh, the school announcement, of course, we we look, took a look at the um, board members uh, of the Department of Secondary Education, uh, and not to my surprise, um, there was one person from Western Mass, someone from Holyoke, no one from the Worcester area. So you've got the the number two and number three largest school districts uh, in 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 the Commonwealth with Springfield and Worcester, and no representation uh, on this board that's going to vote on what to do with the schools from either of those communities. How insane is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, 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 people are fed up. I mean, I think all of us were giving the governor the benefit of the doubt through this whole crisis. Government does need to be united in a crisis. You know, we're not Washington, uh, but th th this is enough is enough. And I'm I'm angry. I mean, I think you and I share the anger about the vaccine issues. You know, the way out of this is the vaccine. Uh, and if people are vaccinated, we can reopen safely. If people aren't vaccinated, we're rolling the dice. And this isn't rocket science. Get the vaccine to local communities get the vaccine to the community health centers, get the vaccine to the senior centers, and people will go and they'll get vaccinated if it's a trusted person administering it. Don't make them run through this obstacle course of a website that crashes. You know, then they then they said that the website was fixed. The way they fixed it was by putting people in a waiting room for 8,000 hours. <laughs> you know, I, I was wow. getting emails from constituents, getting people calling my office and saying, oh, I tried to sign up for my vaccine appointment and it told me I had to wait 8,000 hours just to access the booking software. Wow. I mean, this is this is nuts. We should not be ex we we should be expecting more from our our state government. They had a year to plan for this. We're not asking for the Apollo moon landing. We're asking for a working website, a call in number, and local trusted places to get the vaccine. Then we can start talking about reopening things and moving forward and and getting back to normal. And on schools. You know, we all want kids back, of course. I mean, I see this with my own children, how important it is to get them in school. Uh, but we've got to do it in a way that's smart and safe. And they've got to Absolutely. put their money where their mouth is. If education is so important, prioritize teachers for vaccines. We, we've, got, we've got one child left that's not an adult. And there's no way I'm sending my 13-year-old my wife and I are sending him back into the classroom um, under these present conditions. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just real. What, what else is happening um, in the state house? I, I got to sign off in about five minutes from WTCC. Uh, so give us a quick um, uh, update on anything else that's happening. Yes. Yeah, so I'll be real quick. So bill filing deadline uh, wrapped up last week. So this is, or the week before. Uh, so this is the period where all the bills for the year get filed. Uh, there are about 6,000 that get filed every year. So that's now done. And the process of kind of sorting through all those bills, doing co-sponsorships has started. Uh, I was also renamed chair of the committee on economic development and emerging technologies, right. which I'm really excited about because I do think, you know, fighting for economic Great. justice, Justice, empowerment is going to be big. And we're now actually approaching budget season, believe it or not. Uh, the governor filed his budget. The House is going to be doing their budget in April. We're going to be doing ours in May. So a lot going on, a lot lot new new things happening. We, we welcomed uh, great new members of the Western Mass delegation, including uh, Rep. Orlando Ramos, uh, Rep. Pat Duffy and Holyoke, Senator Gomez. 
Uh, so we've got a, a great a great team uh, from Western Mass working hard and uh, a lot to look forward to. I, I, it's a stressful time, a hard time, but I do think things are looking up also. All right. Give everybody your contact information. Uh, great. Yeah. So phone number at the office, 413-526-6501. Again, 526-6501. Email eric.lesser at masenate.gov. Again, eric.lesser at masenate.gov. We're also on uh, Twitter at Eric Lesser, on Instagram at Eric Lesser MA, and on Facebook, facebook.com slash Eric Lesser MA. All right, Senator, always a pleasure talking to you. Um, see you again on the first Monday uh, of the month uh, and try to stay safe out there. Thanks. You too, Bishop. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. 413-337-1867. Uh, uh, listen, those who are listening on WTCC, if you're looking for a place to worship, check us out at the Spring of Hope, Church of God in Christ, 35 Alden Street. Springfield, Massachusetts, or check us out on our social media, 413 Hope Number Two, um, right here on Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we stream live every uh, Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. Check out our midweek live stream on Wednesdays at 7.30. Go to our website, 413hope.org. Uh, and find out everything uh, that is happening. Listen, uh, right past the break uh, for my streaming audience, First Lady is coming on. So those of you who are looking for her, uh, she'll be coming on. For those who are in my WTCC audience uh, here in Western Mass, Connecticut, Vermont, everywhere our 4,000 watts uh, takes us. It's always a pleasure uh, being with you. Um, so until the next time I talk to you, uh, and you talk to me, always remember God loves you. And so do I. We'll see you next time around. See you next Monday. If the Lord wills, uh, uh streaming audience, hold tight. We'll be right back. Blind that you cannot see. That pale girl child ain't got nothing on me. For hundreds of years, we have stood by your side, accepted your flaws, and allowed you your pride. Bore your children and cleaned up your mess, satisfied your lust, and always settled for less. We have stayed in the background and allowed you to lead, yes, trusting in your strength and ability to succeed. Never getting the praise and credit we deserve, but having the courage, the will, and the nerve 
for being the backbone that has kept it together for you and our children in all kinds of weather. And now suddenly you say we're not good enough for you. We forced you to sell out because of the things we did. Well, where was that white woman when that white man you hate was cracking the whip? In the boardroom, the warehouse, and on the slave ship. She stood by his side and didn't say a word, waiting for her own chance to rule and be heard. And now it's her you turn to and treat like a queen? And me and my sisters you choose to demean? Well, hold up, wait a minute, and stop the damn bus. Because there are a few things I need to remind you about us. A more beautiful creature God never made than an African woman, no matter her shade. High yellow red bone or cocoa brown, we are more than worthy of wearing a crown. Ebony, mocha, or black as the night, it is we who have always shared in your plight. We are passionate, spiritual, loving, and kind. A more generous heart you'll never find than the one that beats inside the body of a Nubian queen, the hardest working, loving, giving woman you've ever seen. But we give and forgive until there's little left. Then we're forced to put up our guard to avoid your theft. The theft of our hearts and our trust, the very nature of our soul, by our so-called brothers who are just playing a role. And you wonder why some of us act as we do? Take a look in the mirror, because the answer is you. It's not enough that the white man has always tried to keep us down. But our own men act as though they'd love to see us drown. And white women have never invited us to join their equal rights struggle. So we're out here alone with the million things we juggle. Raising the children that black men leave behind. And dealing with the racism of the daily corporate grind. Damn, it's no wonder some of us are loud hell. We're just trying to be heard. To be heard. In a world where everyone, including our men, ignore our every word. Where are the brothers who understand a black woman's work? Right here, right here. Who will protect and stand by us? For we are the salt of this earth. We birthed you, raised you, and showered you with love. It was we who taught you to love your creator above us. We gave you all we had and taught you to be men. Open your eyes. It is us, your black sisters, not to go Derek's kind who rate a perfect ten. And one final word for the sellout to claim to be brothers. When you turn your back on us, you disrespect your mothers. That's some hot fire right there, y'all. What y'all know about that? That's that's my late sister, Rhonda Swan. That's called a response to the sellout for all the brothers who be dissing black women and talking about I only date white women because uh, yada, 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 yada. Anyway, I just thought I'd play that right there. All right. Uh, I got the cowgirl up in the spot. <laughs> um, and she's actually from Dallas. She, you know, with the hat and everything. She's from Dallas. Anyway, uh, hey, good morning. <laughs> good morning, babe. How you doing? I'm chilling, like Matt Dillon, maxing and relaxing, like John Saxon. Um, I got okay. that from Mingo. If he's listening, okay. <laughs> the Mingo madness. Um, okay. Yeah, one three three seven eighteen sixty seven. Well, it's old. He he used to say that years and years and years ago. Um, but you're only two years younger than I, so yes. if I'm old, hey, you're old too. But so, you, know, you know, in a couple of weeks now, yeah. I'll just be like, uh, I'll be a little you're less. Only be a year. You only yeah. be a year younger than me. Yeah, for I'll about a month. For for a little while. Yeah, for about <laughs> a month. Somebody asked me why I didn't say nothing about the golden calf. In case y'all who missed it. Um, they literally had a golden statue of Trump uh -huh. Uh -huh. at the CPAC. Literally. Uh -huh. I mean, the, those of you who read your Bible, y'all remember in uh, the Old Testament, and Nebuchadnezzar um, built a golden statue of himself uh, and everybody who, um, when they heard certain kind of music had to bow down 
um, to the golden statue. There's literally pictures at CPAC of people praying and bowing to the Trump statue. These are some sick folks. Some sick well, and, we and, have and, some and, sick and, people. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and white evangelicals who supported him have not condemned that type of idolatry yet. It's it's crazy. Right. It's crazy. It's, it's, uh, it's so, kind of uh, built within the fabric, you know, throughout the nation. Um, I I heard that it was still some uh, Trump uh, paraphernalia, you know, spread throughout the state of Massachusetts in some neighborhoods. People still have not conceded and accepted the fact that the election is over and that Trump is gone. Uh, well, you know, or that, that beat, reality. They're still, and then, they're still talking about he didn't get beat. He said he he's, he's yeah. going to run in 24 and, and, and beat him for a third time. Right. Like, dude, really? Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. It is terrible. And I also heard that they have like these little bobbleheads and they have these statues like within their homes and, and uh, you know, separate places uh, also. So they were, um, you know, I guess these Trumpers were worshiping the man more than um, oh, yeah. any, any, anything else. And, you know, which, you know, kind of brings me to a point <coughs> of uh, how, and I'm, I'm still kind of blown away by it, how the number of uh, that number, although it was small, of course, it was the minority, but that number of black people and that number of, of well, black men and black women and you know and certainly um hispanic um uh, a population that voted for him um it just kind of brings me to how they always made the argument oh i'm voting for him because you know he's done more for black people than any other president i'm voting for him because of policy right you know and uh but that's what they were pushing and i I'm just still, I'm just still in, um, I'm just still lost about that whole thing. You know, that was really an experience, you know, to have to go through that in this country. And I mean, it's bad enough what we have to go through and live with or live through, you know, every day. But to see that, that, you know, we have such a high percentage of people overall, you know, in every group, in every um, in every group that would put somebody like that up uh, to lead us, you know, uh, to be president of the United States was just crazy to me. I'm still dumbfounded by it. Well, then, then, then it was trending yesterday on social media. Uh, Trump 2024 was trending, um, which says we still have yeah. a number of sick individuals that are saying, basically saying, that a guy who is accused of raping 26 right. women mm -hmm. and who incited a deadly white <coughs> supremacist insurrection against the U.S. government and stormed the U.S. Capitol and murdered five people, that this dude is the best person to be president again. These are some again. sick folks. Yes, you know that half of yeah. America is sick. I mean, well, that's, that's the reality. Is we know this we know this as um and, and i don't i don't i i've uh had this revelation recently and i said you know i'm not woke yet i'm awakening you know but we know this we know that um um people who i mean in this generational this, well it's been generational for a long time but people who have bought into you know this fake you know <laughs> this phony a system of a uh, 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 white supremacy of whatever the damage you know the damage that it has done on them as far as their compassion or having any compassion for humanity or even defining you know what they see as um humanity if you will the fact that they choose their racism over humanity lets you know just how much damage has been done on them so let me ask this i t i was talking about on the on wtcc uh about this whole notion of 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 black 
victimhood. Um, and oh, yeah. Bill Maher, who, dis who disappoints me more and more, uh, I, and I don't think it was an anomaly when he called himself a house nigga, um, and Michael Eric Dyson and others came to his rescue, but Ice Cube checked him, um, um, keeps inviting rabid white supremacists onto his program. So again, he had Megyn Kelly. Megyn Santa Claus is just white. Jesus is white Kelly. Uh, uh, Megan, nothing wrong with blackface Kelly. Um, and she was on there complaining about children being taught about social justice, saying that she took her kids out of the, the $50,000 a year private school that they were going to because they went too far and went a hard left and started talking about social justice. Because God forbid white kids be taught about social justice. Um, uh, and then she said that people are leaning into victimhood and that children should not have to learn about racism. And I said, I said, well, you know, uh, I'm sure Tamir Rice might be inclined to agree with you, but he's not available for comment, you know, on that. Um, I mean, this whole notion about black victim, so-called victimhood. And I likened it like this, and I want to get your opinion on it. I said, that's <laughs> like that's like raping a woman and then looking at her and telling her, stop playing the victim. You know, it, 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 that's basically what white America is doing to us. Uh, after, after dehumanizing, brutalizing, and oppressing us for 400 years, and then to turn around and tell us, stop having a victimhood mentality. Well, it's so much that I could say to that, but I, I guess I just try to keep it plain <clears throat> uh, and simple and just say, uh, what I'm tired of is white people telling us, you know, <laughs> what we need to stop doing, you know, or whatever the case may be. Because, um, you know, white supremacists, white supremacists like uh, Megyn Kelly and, um, and, and somebody like me, um, that b believes that justice is for everybody, equality is for everybody, you know, or whatever. We we don't see the world the same. <laughs> we don't see the world the same. And so what she defines as a victim, I don't define as a victim, you know, or whatever the case may be, because she picks well, and her definition is right. her definition her de is anybody who complains about systemic racism. Well, her definition is anybody that complains about what she pushes, you know, <laughs> that 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 uh, exposes her white supremacy. That's her definition that exposes her white supremacy. So she wants to continue, you know, her white supremacy. Uh, she wants to continue to pass that down in her family where we don't, you know, we don't want our children to buy into, you know, this white supremacy. A mentality. We want to expose them to everything that we've been awakened to. I was talking to uh, my soup, well, my clinical supervisor the other day, and sometimes, oftentimes, we get into these discussions. And I was talking about um, as a child how I started to learn about the differences um, of of uh, uh, white supremacy, or you know. Um, how black people move in the world versus, you know, how white people move in the world. And as you know, I was raised by my grandmother and my grandfather. And um, my grandfather was born in 1913 and my grandmother was born in 1918. So when they were like in their 50s or so, I remember walking down, uh, we would be downtown, for instance, and my grandmother would be dressed, you know, to the nine because, you know, they didn't go anywhere, not dressed up, you know, <laughs> whatever the case may be. And we would be downtown and she would be holding my hand and we would be walking. But if white people were coming like um, on the other side and walking toward us, um, my grandmother would move us, you know, almost to the street, you know, to get out the way of the white people who were coming. And so I remember receiving those little psychological messages like, you know, what's 
you know, kind of going on here. It wasn't something that was said to me, but it was like, mm, you know. And then I remember black men, you know, uh, if we were going into the door, going inside someplace or whatever, black men, black boys, you know, would stop and hold the door for us, you know, or whatever the case may be, you know, uh, or whatever. And, you know, just out of uh, general, and I still do this today. If somebody is behind me and I, I get to the door first, I'll hold the door, especially if they're older. You know, I'll hold the door and let, you know, people by, let children in, you know, or whatever the case may be. And so that was, you know, kind of how we were socialized, if, if you will. Uh, but I remember white men letting the door close on oh, my grandmother all the time. Or letting the door close up. It was like we were invisible, you know, or whatever the case may be. And to this day, it's something that, you know, I kind of observe and I pay attention to. So it still happens. It still happens. I can go into the grocery store today and I can be standing in the aisle and I can be kind of standing back, gazing at the shelves, you know, looking for something in particular. And if white people come down the aisle, they'll step in front of me like it ain't nothing. Sometimes they'll step in front of me and they'll, you know, get something off the shelf. Don't say excuse me. Don't say, you know, anything like that. It's strange. It is strange. But anyway, it's the way that we've been uh, psychologically socialized, you know, or whatever, to, like I said, to kind of move into the world. And so it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. That's kind of the long way around what I'm trying to say. It does not surprise me that if Megan Kelly has grew up in this white supremacy kind of socialization, which she has, you know, or whatever, that, you know, she says what she says, you know, with confidence and belief that that's the way that it's supposed to be, you know, that white people are superior, that white people are deserve justice, that white people deserve equality, that white people deserve to be, uh, I don't know, to get a, a quality education, you know, and um, and 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 that's just it. And so, if anybody complains about not receiving, you know, that for their children or themselves or whatever the case may be, then they're the victim. They got a victim mentality. Yeah, they're, they got. You know, they have a. Victim. They're leaning. They're leaning into victimhood. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that whole notion of leaning into victimhood is is. <laughs> It's it's so crazy to me that um and, and it, it and, couldn't be the system, think, right? It couldn't be yeah. them. It couldn't be them well, and it, the, it couldn't be them well, the passing down racism. They, it couldn't be them. I don't think they actually believe the, the nonsense that they're saying anyway. Um it, it's just a convenient way, as I said before, to distract from the conversation that they don't want to have. Because they well, don't yeah. want to have a conversation and the about accountability that they don't want to take. Anything. Yeah, right. They don't want to have a conversation about anything that privileges them. Um, we're not. We're not going to sit here and talk about or condemn a system that wholly privileges um, us. So we're just going to claim that you guys are playing victim, um, and and y'all are a problem. Right. Uh, you know, right. And, that, and that's all there is to that. Uh, it, it's sick. Yeah. It's absolutely uh, well, Jane sick. Elliott, you know, blew that experiment out the water. And, you know, and I watched a lot of her films, uh, you know, over the years and and years ago, I, I, I watched her closely. Uh, and it always amazed me how quick she could turn the uh, blue eyed people against the brown eyed people. You know, yeah. how quick, you know, and of course, you know, her. Her classes was always predominantly white. And, you know, she traveled all over the world, you know, with her experiment. And it was just amazing to me how quick it was, which that lets me know and that let her know that they had already been socialized to believe this. You know, they had already been socialized to believe that they were superior, you know, or whatever. And that's why once, you know, when black people walk into uh, predominantly white spaces, they get the looks that they get, or we get the looks that we get, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Like, 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 what is she doing here? Or what is he doing here? You know, or, or whatever the case may be. Because, you know, white folks have been socialized 
you know, to believe that they are superior and they deserve it. So they feel very entitled, you know, so the arrogance in white supremacy is ridiculous. You know, I call it caucasity. It's caucasity. Yeah, it's, yeah that's true. You know, that's my made up <laughs> word. And that's what I that's what I call it. It's a combination of Caucasian and audacity. Right. So, right. It's, it's caucasity. Right. Um, hi, grandbabies. I don't know which one of my grandbabies is saying hi, Papa. Um, oh, yeah, I see that now. But one of the <laughs> one of the K's, Kaya, Probably Carmen, or Katura. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody said, I tried to send Whitney a link so she can bring him, bring my grandbaby on uh, uh, and say hi. Uh, I'll be on for another about eight minutes. Uh, yeah, and you got a busy day to today. Business. Uh, I'm glad you, you brought up on, this one topic today, babe. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm glad you brought up that one topic today. And for the, especially for the Springfield audience or the Massachusetts audience, you know, or whatever. Please know and understand that uh, we are working, you know, to get some uh, stuff out, if you will, to get a petition out to get some things started uh, because we need to send a message to the governor. Yes, you know, I, I understand that a lot of uh, uh, children, a lot of families want their children back in schools, but if we can't do it in a safe way, to where our families, uh, parents like myself, feel comfortable um, with what's going on concerning the pandemic, then we will not be sending our children back into the uh, unsafe environment. Uh, and mm -hmm. another conversation that we need to have with that, and I, you know, I, I hate to kind of get off, but this is loaded. Um, the uh, another conversation we need to have with that is that. I understand that some parents want to send their kids back to school, but I'm not in a hurry to send my kid back to school. And part of the reason why I'm not in a hurry is one thing is because we can't forget about the group of kids that are flourishing now, you know, that we made some adjustments, uh, you know, for the families that could, you know, that could. We made some adjustments and uh, children are, uh, some children are flourishing with remote learning. Uh, I think that remote hey. learning should have been an option. Should have been an option in the first place. I also think that hybrid should have been an option in the first place. That we should have had. As long as we're going through this pandemic, it it, it ought to be an option, and then there well, should be no what, other. Well, well, well. Wait a minute. That's see. That's what I'm saying. It's it's more than that. It's more than that because the fact of the matter is, black and brown children. Uh, was not receiving a quality education in the first place. And just like I believe, and uh, so many of us uh, in the NAACP believe, you know, it, the prison, the pipeline, the uh, school to prison pipeline was real. It wasn't a, 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 a it wasn't us playing victim. Okay. The, the school to prison pipeline was real. And I think, I think that uh, creating these different options of delivering education you know, or whatever, to black and brown students in particular, or whatever, uh, is cutting back on that system of school to prison pipeline. It's cutting back on that, you know, number one. So we need to continue to be creative in the way that we offer education, you know, to students uh, in general, in, in, in general. So I think that there needs to be a remote department in the school system. I think that there needs to be a hybrid department in the school system. We cannot deliver education anymore and think that it is adequate and sufficient in just one traditional way. All All right. I agree some with students, that. You know, some students will do well at home in a safe environment. You know, for instance, some teachers don't understand uh, if a student has little quirky social behaviors and this that and the other or whatever especially when you have to deal with the 30 students at one time you know or whatever the case may be so it would be better on the school system and it would be better you know certainly with education in general if we start to offer education in different ways you know to meet the needs of the families not just to meet the needs of a school system all right, we're going to transition. I got my grandbaby on. Hi, Kaya. I can't hear you. Hi, I, I need to hear Hi, you. Mimi. Hey, there you go. Hi, baby. How you Hi, doing? Papa. Hi, Mimi. 
Hi, sweetie. How are you guys? Uh, we're good, honey. Hi. <laughs> it's good you're to see okay? you. What's happening? Yeah. Put your face in the camera. I see the I see the ceiling fan. There you go. I agree, Mark Dorsey. We do. We, we, you know, we had an opportunity to put new leadership in place uh, this year. This is a, a political year. So we're voting for school committee members. We're voting for city council seats. All of that is up this year. So you're absolutely right. So, you know, we do need new leadership from the superintendent on. Well, and one from the mayor on down, actually, you know, we need new leadership. So come on. I agree. Baby. Baby girl, where's your sisters at? Um, I don't know. I know Carmen's at school though. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Hi, Dad. Hey, Ma. Hey, Ray. Hey, hey what's happening? <coughs> Not too much. What y'all up to in, in the chat? Remote huh? learning. Remote learning. Yep. Yes. Hey, Hi, sweetie. How you Look, doing? Well, you? My husband is completely distracted right now. Oh, my grandbaby. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, she's in class. Ty is on asynchronous learning right now. Um, so she's, you know, on with her teacher. So we're just doing this remote learning. Yeah. I got to right. make this comment to Mark. Mark, you're so right. The DA says that the school to prison pipeline is not in Hamden County. Yeah, just like Collateral said that racism is, is not a problem here. You know, that racism is not a of racism in the police department is not a problem here in Springfield. So yeah, all of our leadership is just screwed up. They don't have a good understanding. <laughs> All right, grandbabies. I just wanted to holler at y'all. I wanted to see y'all and show y'all off. <laughs> I love you. Love you too, Papa. Love you, Mimi. I love you too, baby. It was good to see you. We'll talk later, okay? Okay. All right. Bye. See y'all later, baby. All right. Got to go. Got a busy day. Got stuff to do, people to see. All that kind of stuff. I see you, Mark. Um, so I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna go on, and you know, and maybe we can have a conversation afterwards. I see you, Mark. So I'm I'm trying to get a better understanding of some of the things you're talking about. But okay. All right. Once again, Sunday, eleven. <laughs> check us out this Wednesday. Uh, check out the Pastors Council Linton services. They'll they're streaming. Check out the Pastors Council page. Uh, every Wednesday up until Resurrection uh, Day, we are in the middle of the Lenten season right now. Um, and so until the next time I talk to you and you talk to me, always remember God loves you. And so do I. Peace. Bye, everybody. <coughs>